So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Thessalonians 1, the first Thessalonians chapter 1. If you're in the New Testament, you'll see Acts, you'll see Romans, you get into Corinthians and Colossians, and then 1 Thessalonians. If I were to ask you a question, what does a Christian look like? I'm curious what the answer would be. Now, for the sake of those joining us on on YouTube who may not want to sit here for 8 or 10 hours, we're not going to all just answer what does a Christian look like. But as is our new way, while we're talking about those joining us online, those watching, let's welcome them as we did a meet and greet. We want to welcome those joining us uh, virtually to New Hope Service today. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Sorry you missed out on coffee and donuts. We couldn't just ship them to everybody. But (laughs) if you'll join us on Sunday mornings, we have coffee and donuts as well. So what does a Christian look like? If you were to try to put that together, how would we describe a believer? And we could come up with things. We could come up with uh, statements, everything from dress to things of the heart to things of the spirit. We could come up with all this. But I guess my question, if you're not one, if you haven't grown up around believers, if you're just outside of the building, outside of the church, outside of everything, what does a Christian look like? Can you even describe it? Can you even identify it? Can you point it out? Can you interact with someone and say, that's it. That is a believer. I've encountered one. That's what we want to talk about today. Part of what we're going to focus on, what does a Christian look like? Has anybody ever been to a personal trainer? Anyone have any experience with a personal trainer? Anyone? I know I do. I know there was a time many years ago I went and decided I was going to pay some guy to be my personal trainer, and it lasted for about three weeks, and I was done. But I remember going to this personal trainer, and I remember he was just killing me. And I remember at one point just sweating, drops of sweat falling, and he gets down on the floor, and do you know what that sweat is? We call that progress. And I thought, what if I hit you with a tennis racket? I would call that progress right now. It was miserable. But he knew what he was doing. He had a purpose. He was finding joy in my pain. And I remember doing other exercise programs where where pain was an aspect of it. Discipline was an aspect of it. Difficulty is an aspect of growth, of experience, of becoming who we're supposed to be. We're in Thessalonians today. A little bit on Thessalonians. It was written to a church in a place called Thessalonica, which... Just another way of saying that this is who they were. This was their town. This is a city of about 200,000 people when Paul came and ministered there and wrote this passage. In this church, they were in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of struggle, in the midst of strife, in the midst of things that we've never experienced. We have experienced some level, I guess, as believers of persecution. You could lose a friendship as a believer. You could lose a job as a believer. You could, you could say things that will be considered hateful simply because you're speaking from your perspective. We can experience that sometimes. This group of people, they were losing their livelihood. They were told, because you're a believer, you can't work. Because you're a believer, we're not allowed to buy your goods. So they, weren't, they didn't have money. Because you were a believer, your family and friends were not going to talk to you anymore. You were ousted. You were on the outskirts. You believe you've changed religion. You're not worshiping our gods. We have nothing to do with you. They were being beaten. They were being put to death. And so this is the group that Paul is beginning with encouraging, and he begins with basically a statement of, of what a believer looks like. Who is a believer? Thessalonians, First and Second Thessalonians, I promise to get to our passage in a minute. First and Second Thessalonians is really a lot, a lot of times considered prophetic as there's so much has to do with the second coming of Christ. So much has to do with what we would call the end times. We use all these big words for it, but a lot of Thessalonians has a prophetic aspect because a lot of being a believer is hoping for a better future. A lot of being a believer is this being attached to 
the future we have in God, to the promises we have in God. And so while a lot of this book, a lot of these two books deal with those events, really these books deal with what does it mean to be a believer? What does the church look like? What are we supposed to look like? Who are we supposed to be as believers? So if you've got your Bibles open, and I hope you do, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, read with me, then we will spend a little bit of time in it. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope. In our Lord Jesus Christ, in the presence of our God and Father, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescued us from the wrath to come. Amen and amen. I love that our passage mentions his choice of you. And it mentions the prayers that they had for him, how they are praying for these people. They are praying continually. You know, I would say that today people need to know what a Christian looks like. Today, our community around us need to know what a Christian looks like. They need to know who we are. They need to know what makes us different. They need to know of the hope that we have. Right now, if you get on social media, if you have friends in your network that are not believers, sometimes as believers, we get into a bubble. We get into such a social network bubble that we think everybody is exactly like us and everybody thinks like us and everybody feels like us and everybody believes like us. And we get isolated and we don't see the other side, the other bubble. We don't see that there are people who really, really think that we're against them and really think that the believers, believers are out there trying to harm them and trying to hurt them and trying to, to do all these oppressive type things because they don't know who we are. They don't see a picture of who we are. They know that the way they want life sometimes is against what we stand for, what they think we stand for. And so they don't have a picture of who a believer is. And what I would say, our communities outside of us need to know who we are, need to know what we look like, need to know what we stand for. And the way they know that is by us knowing who we are and us knowing what we stand for and us representing Christ in authenticity. So my question for you, believers, what should you look like? What does a Christian look like? What does a Christian do? What are your activities? What do you do in your faith? Is your faith completely and totally passive? I got saved and now I sit saved. Is that a passive faith? Is salvation passive? Is this an act of passivity? It is not. In fact, it's a very active thing. Our faith is very active and there's a lot that we should be doing so I would ask the question that I asked you what does a Christian look like if we were taken in into a lineup would they be able to look at you and say that's the guilty one that's the believer 
I hope it's not because of your hair or because of your dress that they're like, oh, yep, that person's a Christian. I can easily recognize like an Amish person, like with the horse and buggy and all that. It's easy to recognize, but that's not who they are fully. They are more than that. Can you even recognize a Christian? So let's get into what he said. Let's look at what is our activities. What are we doing? What should we be doing? Verse 3 tells us, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith. Your work of faith. Christians should be working out their faith. We should be doing the activities of faith. When you get into this word work, it talks about doing our very best at something. Absolutely pursuing something, to strive towards something, to make it in essence, it's a business term, it is speaking of your business. So my question, New Hope, is do you clock in to your faith? Do you punch into your time clock of your faith? The amount of energy that you give to work, the amount of energy you give to earning an income, the amount of energy you give to your garden got to throw in my garden the amount of energy you give to your hobby your favorite thing does your faith match that are you focused in are you striving towards are you pursuing the best of your faith speaking to our mind right now our attitude our focus our drive is our faith one of those things that we drive to we focus on and if i were to ask what is faith what would the answer be because i will give you what the word he used here means what he's speaking of is constantly continually relying on a person continually relying on jesus christ putting so much of my trust in him that I'm engaging my mind. I'm engaging my my hands. I'm engaging my work. I am making a mental, intentional, actively engaged, working, striving, thinking, committing, trusting in Jesus. How many of us find times where we just float through our faith I got saved I checked that off I went up to the altar I had an experience it was a moving experience I shed a tear I may have shed two or three it was beautiful people came and prayed over me we had great songs when I was younger in high school I went I got baptized in the ocean it was moving my, one of my favorite musicians at the time, a guy named Rob Frazier, who played with a group called Petra, which was my favorite, he was there. He was there. He was playing the guitar, and we were singing songs, and I went and got baptized, and it was beautiful. And then when I came home, and I was back to my normal self, I floated for a few more years, not really actively engaging in the things of faith, not really working at it. As Paul said, working out my salvation. Paul is encouraging us to show up, to clock in every day when it comes to your faith. Is faith like a movie night? I go to the movie. I get in a chair that leans back. I get popcorn. I get candy. I mix the candy in the popcorn so it melts. I do all those things. Some of us are looking at me like, ooh, gross. But if you've done it, you know it's great. But I do these things. But that's movie night, but that's not preparing for an activity. That's not a sporting thing, an an athletic thing, an exercise thing, a workout thing. That is intentional, active, disciplined. One of the things I've been doing since January, as you guys know, is that I've been fasting a lot, too much, I think. Sometimes I miss a big burger, but I've been fasting. And I've been exercising, and the funny thing, running took a whole lot of time and a whole lot of pain and a whole lot of, I could run 50 steps and that's it. And then, okay, I can run 100 steps and that's it. And I can run 125 steps and that's it. And slowly, slowly, slowly building, slowly increasing 
making a decision that I was going to lose weight from January to now didn't cause me to lose weight. Making a decision that I was going to run from January to now didn't make it where I could run. It was the activity of actually fasting first like eight hours, then nine hours, then ten hours. And, okay, instead of a cheeseburger, I guess I'll do grilled chicken. Instead of, grilled, instead of fries, I guess I'll do other vegetables. Making these decisions, it was the making the decision of engaging and running and slowly walking and running and building these things. Why am I saying all this? Because we are to actively, physically, day in, day out, slowly build, slowly strengthen our faith. We're supposed to exercise it. He's saying the way you work your faith is one of the things that a Christian looks like. We work our faith. We work it hard. We strengthen it. We engage it. We grow in it. We do things like we read the Bible, we study the Bible, we pray through the Bible. It began when Paul said, we've been praying for you guys. Understand, these are people who are being killed, being fired, not being able to buy food, not being able to earn. This is not a now I lay me down to sleep, pray for you at bedtime prayer. This is I am physically praying for for you because I know you and I care about you and I see what you are going through. We must actively be engaged in our faith, working with our mind, trusting in Jesus day in and day out. When it makes sense, when it doesn't make sense, when it's easy, when it's hard. Why? Why does any of this matter? Why should I do this? Number one, it's easy to fall off the wagon and fall, slip back into what I would say a legalism attitude. It's easy to slide into a, I'm going to make a bunch of rules, make a huge list, and i got to check off every list every single day, and next thing I know, I am doing all the work and I'm earning it, as opposed to I am actively engaging, mentally trusting Jesus. Two, it's easy to go to the other side and to slip into a life of I just sin when I want to, because you know what, sin is fun and our natural nature is to, sin. That's our natural nature. It's easy to slip into that too. Number three, and here's the big reason. Because whether your faith is strong or your faith is weak, whether you've exercised it or you've just floated through life, doesn't change the fact that pain is coming. Every one of us in our lives will experience pain. We will have something that shakes us. We will have something that rocks us. We will lose a loved one, we will have a financial crush, we will have something that is going to hurt and is going to make us depend on our faith. And whether we have built a strong faith or not will impact how we go through that experience, how we go through the hard times. It doesn't make it hurt less, but trusting Jesus makes it better. It doesn't make it feel easy, but trusting Jesus makes it better. Faith strengthens us when we strengthen faith. As we strengthen our faith, it strengthens us. On the topic of of faith, Paul said, I have fought the good faith, the good fight. I have kept the faith. He said, I've run the race. That's what Paul said. John said, everyone born of God overcomes the world. And then later he said, victory is our faith. These are active, physical, challenging, hard things. James would say, testing your faith is what produces endurance. Paul also said, be on guard, stand Firm in your faith. For too many, faith is passive. For too many, faith is I got saved, now I'm a believer, now I get to sit and be happy and be good. When in fact, what the scripture tells us, when in fact, what life tells us, in fact, what the challenges of pain and sorrow teach us, pain must be active, faith must be active, faith must be fierce, it must be energized, it must be engaged. Faith 
is our mind. Faith, hope, and love. These are the three things Paul loved to go to. Faith is the mental aspect. I am choosing to trust. I am mentally teaching myself. I am trusting. I am praying. I am fasting. I am studying. I am not simply reading, but I'm studying it. I'm asking questions. Who, what, where, when, why? It's called meditating on the scriptures. I'm doing these things to make myself better. Exercise sharpens your faith. This is what we should be doing. This is what I would say your enemy hopes you are not doing. This is what your family, whether they know it or not, hopes that you are doing because you will be the bedrock. You'll be the one who they will come to. You'll be the one they can depend on. Verse 3 again tells us, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love. Faith, hate, faith, hope, and love. Faith, mental. Love, this is your physical. This is the engaging the physical Christian aspects. Our mind is our faith, labor of love. When it comes to love, he's not speaking of an emotional thing. I always struggled with this growing up. I always tried to figure out, how am I supposed to love God? Like, how do I love God? Like, I, I don't understand this. I couldn't get my mind around this. Because to me, love, well, that's like ooey, gooey, emotional, bubbly, feeling things. Didn't make sense to me. But the word he's actually using, it's agape. It's not, it's not emotional, bubbly, ooey, gooey love. We would use the word loyalty, choice, choosing to love, choosing that I am with you, choosing I am with God. And it's funny that that's the word also that he uses of God's love for us. It is an active, chosen, willful act of love. It's not the emotional, ooey, gooey love. It is willfully choosing loyalty, an act of the will. We choose to love God. God chooses to love us. I say that to say this is also the love that we're supposed to use for others. It's for our friends, for our enemies, for our community, for our stranger, for the sojourner, for the immigrant, for anybody we encounter. We are to choose love. We are to agape them. We are to actively, physically choose to love them. That's the easier of the two words he used here. You're like, well, how in the world are you saying that loving, making a choice to love a total stranger and my enemy is easy? It's easy because we haven't talked about labor yet. He said labor of love. When he said labor, if I were to ask you what is labor, you would say work or childbirth. What he's actually stating here when he says labor, let me ask this. Have you ever worked so hard that when you walked in the door, you skipped dinner, you skipped the refrigerator for a drink, you skipped dessert, you didn't turn on the TV, you didn't even take your shoes off, you just fell into bed and waited till morning. You ever worked to that extent where it was absolutely so exhausting? I remember my first day of ever working at Amazon and I walked 20 miles that first day. The day before was like 10 years of a desk job. And walked 20 miles, and I did not walk in the house. I crawled like military forearm crawl in the house because my feet hurt so bad. Physically exhausting. The word he uses here, the best way to translate it is you gave 150% of every drop of sweat you had for loving others. Have we done that? church have we loved our neighbors so much that we just collapsed at the end of it boy this vbs is going to be rocking if we apply that approach we are going to be so worn out we can't stand it if we apply that approach but he says the labor we do the labor of love the way we love as believers is 110 percent of everything we've got and then another 110 percent in essence Leave it all on the field. Our love should be so much, it takes everything out of us. There's a movie called Ghost in the Darkness. 
It's this movie about these lions in Africa. It's kind of a true story about these lions in Africa that were attacking people and the stuff they did to try to stop these lions. And there's this one scene where this guy who is a missionary is sitting by the fire and his hand, about every centimeter and a half, there's another Band-Aid where they were building what's called a boma, which is these massive thorn hedges. And the thorns were about this long. And it's made out of, I think, acacia wood. And they would build all these massive hedges that were rows and rows deep and circling the people to try to keep the lions out. And they still do it to this day. They build these networks of hedges to keep the lions from getting their livestock over there. Because the lions, well, they don't like to get stuck by thorns. I don't either. I get that. But that's what he was doing. His hands were just covered, just Band-Aids everywhere. And he was looking at his hands, and they were kind of laughing. And they said, missionary, I bet you've never done work like this before. And he kind of laughed and kind of made the comment that it feels good. It feels good. As bad as it hurts, it feels good to have worked like this. That's the work we're supposed to do. That's the energy level of love we're supposed to do. We're supposed to literally leave it all on the field. Our labor of love is holding nothing back. To be physically beat down at loving others. Whatever it takes, you held nothing back. I think Jesus said if they ask you to walk a mile, what? Walk two. If they ask for your jacket, go ahead and give them your shirt as well. Whatever it is, leave nothing back. Double it in your generosity. Double it in your love. Double it in your forgiveness, in your grace, in your mercy, in your welcoming attitude, in your kindness, in your joy. Your work of love should be an exhausting pace. My work of love should be an exhausting pace. He says it's the labor of love. The labor of it. What does a Christian look like? Our minds are all about our faith, our trust in Jesus. We are talking to ourselves about how much we trust. We are, we are absolutely engaging our minds, coming up with evidence for why we trust. I think Peter said, always be prepared to give an answer for the hope you have. Always be prepared to give an answer for this. In our hands, we should be loving so much that we're exhausted. And then our hearts, that's our hope. Our faith is in our minds. Our love is in our hands. And our hope is in our hearts. Verse 3 again tells us, Constantly bearing in mind your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope your steadfastness of hope what do we hope for church what is it a christian hopes for i hope you can answer that question i hope when somebody asks what do you hope for i'm using hope a lot i uh, really really want <laughs> that if someone asks you what do you hope for as a believer that your answer would be i'm hoping for a future divinely promised by god a future divinely guaranteed by Jesus Christ. Because the hope that it's speaking of here, the hope is expecting a divinely appointed future is the way it is worded in the original language. I am expecting a divinely appointed future. It is guaranteed by the blood of Jesus Christ. It has been worked out. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, which means I'm coming back when it's finished. It's no accident he's a carpenter. He's building a future for us. It's hope in a divinely appointed thing. It speaks of steadfastness. You are unmovable in your trust in the future he has for you. You are unshakable. You don't wish, I don't think, I don't, as we would say sometimes, using hope in a different way. Well, I hope 
No, no. It's expectation. Fully expecting a divinely done thing. Persevering. Trusting. Enduring. Standing firm. Speaks almost of a military line of perseverance, of endurance. If I were to find a new way to take it as kids, remember Red Rover? Red Rover, Red Rover, send Johnny on over. And when Johnny's come running, you can just lock arms of everything you got because Johnny's not going to break through our line. Perseverance. Doesn't matter what comes my way. I am holding firm to the promise of a divinely appointed future. I don't just believe it. I'm expecting it. I'm waiting on it. It's on its way. And every day between now and then, I am joyfully, gleefully looking at the future God has for me. Amen? That's our hearts. One of my favorite stories of the Bible, and I better check my time. One of my favorite stories of the Bible is on Joseph and on Potiphar's wife and how she was trying to get him to to do things with her. And what... If you read over what you may miss, is this wasn't a one-time conversation. This was likely years of when Potiphar would leave every day. Years of her pursuing and her attacking, her trying to tear him down. And Joseph continually stood firm because he believed in God and because he was loyal to his friend. He stood firm and it cost him at the time, one could, say it, one could say it cost him everything at that moment. Now, we know the end of the story, but it cost him imprisonment. He stood firm. He endured. He persevered. Our hope should be that, that nothing's going to shake my hope of the promise of a divinely secured future. I am waiting and expecting what God is doing for me, my heart knows what's in store for me. I'll tell you a story as we close of a man named Herman. Herman was, was a piano teacher of a local school. And he was attending this massive concert of one of the greatest pianists of their time. And he was playing one of the most difficult pieces and got very sick and left the stage. And everybody was there who had paid to see the concert. So Herman got up from the back row, walked up to the front, sat at the piano, and completed the piece. He played the piece. And afterwards, somebody asked him, said, how is it possible that, I mean, I understand you're a piano teacher, but how is it possible you were able to play that piece of music, just like he was playing it. And Herman said, I was a, a young, aspiring piano player in 1939 when the Germans arrested me for being a Jew and I was sent to a, a concentration camp. True story. He said, for five years when I was in that camp, what kept me from just going crazy is I hoped to one day be able to play again. And so what I did is at first I started just on my leg, just practicing the little piece. He said, and then I started reaching over and just playing on on a little piece of wood there. I would play a piece. And then I started expanding the pieces from my memory, and I would play. And that's what I would do at night is I would just play the piece and hope one day I would get to play a piano again. And one of the pieces that I played every night was the piece he just played. And I would just play it on the wood. He said, I never stopped practicing it because I never stopped hoping to be able to play it again. We never stop hoping for the future that God has for us. We wait expectingly. Storms will come. Storms will absolutely hit us. We're going to get shook. We're going to get rocked. We're going to have loss. We're going to be hated. We're going to suffer persecution. It could happen. 
not guaranteeing it's going to happen in the United States, but it could happen. You will, I can guarantee, have hard times. You will have heartache. You will be hit. Our hope is not in an easy life. Our hope is not in riches and wealth and all these things. Our hope is not in nothing sad ever happening. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. And our hope is in the secure eternity He has for us. And our hope is in the expectation of a divinely appointed future. And as we close, I'll tell you real quick what that future is. Yes, when we die, absent from the body is present with the Lord. Yes, we're in the presence in heaven, but that's not where it ends. That's the holding spot. It comes back to here. It comes back to eternity on earth. It comes back to Jesus forever here with us. It comes back to that Garden of Eden fellowship where, yes, we can take a walk with God. It comes back to here forever and ever and ever and ever with friends and loved ones and not growing old and Sunday dinners and it comes back to here. Heaven almost seems scary sometimes when you're talking to youth because they can just see, I'm just going to be floating in a cloud forever. Not a bit. There will be no floating in a cloud. There will be a waiting period with friends and loved ones followed by work and grapes and laughter and growing but not growing old. A divinely appointed future is yours if you trust in Jesus Christ. Are you expecting it? So my question for you, New Hope, are you all in on your faith? Are you all in on your love? Are you all in in your hope? Are you actively engaging your mind, your hands, and your heart? Do you look like a Christian? Good news is, hopefully the sermon is a mirror. You can look in and go, wow, I need to up my love. Or it looks like I'm a little depleted in my mind because I've been just all questions and it's wandering and I'm not really doing the things I'm supposed to do. Or maybe my heart's not involved, it's grown cold. Now's the time to become all three. Faith, hope, and love actively engaged 100% in all three. And then people will look at you and say, there's something different about this one. What does a Christian look like? It looks like you. Actively engaged, 100% all in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, thank you for faith, hope, and love. Thank you for the challenge and the truth that we should be fully committed mentally, physically, emotionally, fully committed as a spiritual being of yours. God, we can't wait for the future you've promised us. Between now and then, may we not wait, but may we instead get actively engaged in loving others and actively engaged in learning more of you and becoming more like you. God, may we be the picture of Jesus Christ as he is the picture of you, Father. God, our neighbors should know what new hope looks like. They should know what you look like because of new hope. We should be such great people of faith and love and talking about the things you're doing and the promises you have for us that the excitement just spills over into the communities around us. God, teach us to get 100% now. Teach us to become about this community now. Teach us to become the people who look like Jesus right now. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the challenge of who you've called us to be, and thank you for the hard work involved in becoming more like Jesus. Amen. All right, we're going to have a VBS meeting for all who are staying.